Hello and welcome to the program. I'm your host, Neil Howard, here on Health Professional Radio. Glad that you could join us for another segment. In this segment, we're going to have a conversation with Dr. Kirk Shepard, CMO, SVP, and Head of Global Medical Affairs, Oncology Business Group at uh, ASI. He's joining us to talk about the final results from the Keynote 146 Study 111 that was presented at the 2019 ESMO Congress. Welcome to the program, Dr. Kirk Shepard. How are you this evening? Thank you very much. I'm doing fine, thank you. I did mention, of course, your position there uh, at the company. If you could give us a brief background about yourself, and then let's talk about uh, endometrial cancer. Certainly. No, as you said, I'm Chief Medical Officer for Oncology for Azi and Head of Global Medical Affairs. I've been at Azi now for about two and a half years, uh, but I've been in the pharmaceutical industry for almost 30 years. Uh, I'm a board-certified medical oncologist and a hematologist, and my training was at the University of Chicago. However, the majority of my uh, work as far as uh, research has been in solid tumors. Most of our listeners are healthcare providers in some capacity or another and may not be as familiar as you are with endometrial cancer. Explain to us what endometrial cancer is, and let's talk about the, the current treatment landscape. Sure. Endometrial cancer is also called uterine cancer. It's a cancer of women, and it occurs in the inner liner, lining of the uterus, uh, usually the, uh, the muscle-like layer of the uterus. Uh, the lining there goes aberrant, uh, usually turns into a cancer sometime around middle to late age, with uh, median age somewhere probably in the late 50s. Uh, it is an important cancer, even though a lot of people have not heard about it, but it is increasing dramatically throughout the world. And the reasons for this are felt to be because it's associated with increasing obesity. And so the increasing rates of obesity in many countries around the world are bringing parallel with it an increase in uterine cancer. Obesity has been known when you are overweight to increase estrogen levels. And like in breast cancer and some other cancers, these increased estrogen levels can lead to cancers down the line. So... I think we will all hear more about uterine cancer as time goes on because of its increasing incidence. Now, fortunately, the majority of these cancers in the uterine are caught early. Uh, Probably around three-quarters of them or more are caught early and are successfully surgically treated. A number of patients, because of maybe bad prognosis, because of the cell type or where it's spread, we'll get what we call adjuvant chemotherapy. And adjuvant means to help. So in other words, there's no evidence of tumor usually, but they get the chemotherapy to keep it from coming back, to keep those small cells from growing back into a tumor. And occasionally too, they'll get radiation therapy also in an adjuvant level to keep the tumor from coming back. Mm -hmm. So the difficult percentage of these patients are those that have advanced Uh, uterine cancer. That means it's usually spread beyond the uterus into the lymph nodes, perhaps into organs. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, of course, the the difficult patients are also the ones who recur after they receive their surgery and adjuvant therapy. And so these are the ones we call advanced uterine cancer. And this is the type of cancer we're talking about today that we are treating. It is really a celebration sort of that lymphoma and pembrolizumab have gotten the results that they have in the past couple of years. The reason is there's not really been a successful chemotherapy passed by the FDA or other regulatory agencies for almost 50 some years. The last drug that was approved was magestrol acetate or magase, which is a type of endocrine or hormonal treatment, and nothing has been approved in the meantime. Recently, just a couple of years ago, pembrolizumab, this is a immuno-oncology or IO drug, was approved for a certain type of endometrial or uterine cancer. And those are the types that are called MSI high. That means microsatellite instability high. It means that the tumor or the cells themselves are very unstable and have an increased rate of not repairing themselves. This unfortunately is only maybe 20 to 30% of the uterine cancers. So we're left with a large majority of those with uterine cancer who have non-MSI tumors. And this is what the trial was directed at in treating these patients with non-MSI high uterine cancer. And we combined together embrolizumab or Keytruda, which is a IO or immuno-oncology drug, 
and also a targeted drug called Lindema or Lenvatna. And those are the results that are reported out, Neil, at ESMO. As far as you know, when these two drugs are combined, do they prevent recurrence as well? Well, that's a great question. I, I think in the, in the beginning, when you go back a few years as far as the research on Lindema and Lindatinib, but I can speak mostly about that because that's the research that occurred with Azi. We do preclinical studies to see against animal cells or cells like in a petri dish, how well do these drugs work individually and combined with others? And at that time, there was some sign that the IO therapy, pembrolizumab, and our drug, lenvatinib or lenvima, worked together because they affected different mechanisms of the cancer cell. That being that the IO drug, pembrolizumab, affects the the, the, the program death ligon or PDL1 of the tumor. In other words, it allows the tumor to be very susceptible and shuts off the immune defenses. Lenvima acted in a way that affected the micro environment of the tumor cell and, and fought those effects uh, that would also decrease the immune system in somebody's body. So the two together working by different mechanisms were felt right from the beginning in preclinical, that these drugs may look good when you get them to the clinics and treat patients. So initially that was done, they had a small cohort, as we call it, of patients with a number of tumors, one being endometrial, which we're talking about today. And these 30 patients got remarkable results by combining these two drugs together. In fact, they were so remarkable that Merck and Azi came together in a co-development or co-research and also co-promotion deal. And this was about a year and a half ago. Were there any significant side effects that were out of the out of the norm for this type of treatment or these types of drugs, either combined or separately? Yeah, so that's another good question because naturally the concern when you combine together any two drugs, uh, you're concerned about what's going to be the effects of them coming together. And we were happy to hear in the ESMO results, which we'll go over here in a minute, as far as how well the tumor responded, that we saw that it was each drug had its percentage of side effects that was not increased by the combination together. And we saw no additional side effects that we were not expecting. There was only one small increase in a side effect, which is called hypothyroidism. Notice the thyroid is not responding as well, but that was a small amount. And so we were happy to see the majority of other side effects there was no increase combining the two together. So is there any uh, more that you can tell us about this uh, collaboration between uh, ASI and Merck? Yeah. I mean, we were brought together by the results of what's called a basket trial. And the basket trial is you put together many types of tumors with uh, a combination of drugs. And we did that with pembrolizumab and Lenvima. And we showed that in a number of these tumors, of which endometrial was one, that we got the high results with, with, with um, insignificant amount of adverse events that cause us to come together. So it's been a very good alliance. Alliances are something that are very common now in pharmaceutical industry, two companies coming together to form a partnership to develop and then sell the drug. And uh, we, we wouldn't have been able to advance ourselves so quickly through the tumor types if it wasn't for the partnership with Merck and us coming together. So in other words, we now have a total of around seven tumor types being tested in clinical trials with this combination that go to approximately 13 clinical trials altogether. And then we also have another basket trial that involves another six types of tumor types. This type of of, of research can take years sometimes in an individual company. But our two companies coming together, we're advancing treatment very quickly, so hopefully we can get access to the patient and the treaters. All right, well, let's talk about some of the other results of the study. Yes, yeah, so this is a, 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 a study that was reported out at ESMO, and so that's the European Society of Medical Oncology. It's a big meeting, one of the biggest in the world. And, and this study was a single-arm trial of the combination of pembrolizumab, the drug we mentioned before, which is Keytruda from Merck and uh, is a immuno-oncology drug, and our drug, which is a targeted agent called lenvatinib or lenvima from Aza. 
This was at a total of 108 patients. So this study will be uh, taken to another stage. We're having a trial now to verify the results in hundreds of more patients. But this data itself was significant enough that we got an approval by the FDA. Mm -hmm. So we had 94 patients who did have did not have MSI high, that's that microinstability high, that pembrolizumab alone treats well. Ours were non-MSI high. And so in this trial, we saw a 38.3% response rate in patients who had already been treated. In other words, these are advanced endometrial carcinoma patients who had had previous systemic chemotherapy and still had a 38.3% percent response. In fact, remarkably, about half of the patients had been treated twice, and this was their third treatment or more. Of that 38.3 percent response, we saw that there was a complete response. The tumor disappeared in about 10 percent of the patients, and around 27 percent of that number, it, it decreased by 30 percent. So these were thrilling results for us. But one of the thrilling things, too, about the results of the study is the median duration of response was not reached yet. In other words, 69% of the patients still had a response at six months. And that's incredibly important to us as oncologists, not only getting a response rate where the tumor shrinks, but the duration is also of a meaningful duration. So those are kind of the bottom line uh, results of the study. We are going on now with a confirmatory study, uh, both in the uh, advanced carcinoma of people who have been previously treated with systemic chemotherapy, as well as a first-line uh, treatment for endometrial carcinoma, and hopefully we'll have these results uh, to you and others in the next uh, year or two. Well, Dr. Shepard, I, I thank you for joining us here on Health Professional Radio this uh, evening. Lots of great information, hoping that um, we'll get a chance to talk again in the future. My pleasure. Thanks so much. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, in conversation with Dr. Kirk Shepard. Audio of this program is available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. You can listen in and download it SoundCloud. And be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Health Professional Radio.